So today's sermon is going to be a little unusual in some ways. For one thing, I'm actually going to use a printed text, and I'm going to be behind the pulpit for once. But you'll see why. Um, and uh, Tyler, we should move the mic for Laura, right? Yeah. Um, in today's scripture reading, Jesus asks a famous question. Who do you say I am? In many ways, it's the most important question that can be asked in our faith, because it matters so much how we answer it. If we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, second person of the Trinity, then, of course, we're going to listen very closely to what Jesus says and feel impelled to follow him because he's the one who created us. On the other hand, if we, are, if we're, if we believe that Jesus is uh, just one wise man who said a bunch of wise things 2,000 years ago, no different from, say, Socrates or Confucius or Gandhi, then that's going to change how we listen to what Jesus has to say because we can take it or leave it. We're either impressed by what he says or we're not, so we can leave it aside. Or if we think that Jesus was basically a fictional character created by some Palestinian Jews 2,000 years ago, then, of course, we can reject the whole thing. And just to say, oh, the New Testament's just a novel, really. You know, maybe there's some good stuff in there, just like there's good stuff in Dickens, but I don't have to follow it. So it matters a lot how we answer that question, who do you say I am? Who do we think Jesus is? I suspect that for most of us here, we, the answer to that question is that Jesus is our moral leader. He's the one who shows us how to live a caring and compassionate life in an ethical way. That's why we come to church. This is something I talked about in more detail in last week's sermon. But the idea that Jesus is primarily a moral Messiah is a relatively new one. It really becomes cemented in the last few hundred years. Earlier Christians saw Jesus in a different way. They answered the question of, who do you say I am, quite differently. And this relates to what I was doing in Rome this summer. The reason I love looking at art generally, and Christian art in particular, is that Christian art has a problem. Jesus lived in the first century, and the very first Christian art doesn't appear until the 200s. All the people who knew Jesus were dead. No one remembered what he looked like. So how do you present Jesus if you're going to make a visual representation of him? Should he be presented scowling? Because most people don't get it. (laughs) Should he be presented smiling? Should he always be depicted in maybe dark tones because of his tragic death? All of those things are possible. So they help us answer these visual depictions of Jesus. Who did they think Jesus was? Now, the earliest depictions of Jesus appear in the 200s in a place called the catacombs outside of the walls of Rome. These were underground burial places that were outside the city walls. And Christians painted pictures into the walls of those tombs. And here's what we find on some of those walls. These are places I went. This is from the Catacomb of Domitia, and that's one of the first depictions of Jesus that we have. So Jesus is depicted as the good shepherd. You can see the sheep around him. And this, of course, is an allusion to the famous line from the Gospel of John, I am the good shepherd. The sheep, because this is occurring in a place of human burial, Those sheep are meant to symbolize human souls, right? Jesus is shepherding human souls to the afterlife. But he's also surrounded by birds and vines as well. So this is a picture from the catacomb of Priscilla. And you see Jesus again in the center as the good shepherd. Um, But you'll notice that there's birds all around him, right? There's birds in the trees next to him. And then there's peacocks. on two sides, and there's partridges on the other side. Peacocks were considered beautiful then as now, and they were symbolic of immortality. But this, and the thing is that they had a choice about how they represented Jesus. 
they could have represented Jesus as a soldier, right? Guarding the souls that went into the afterlife. But they didn't. Instead, they decided to present Jesus as, an, as a figure embedded in nature, as a shepherd, and surrounded by birds and vines and so forth. They didn't have to do that, but that's what they chose to do. This natural imagery continues as time goes on. 100 years later, in the 300s, Constantine has his famous vision of a cross in the sky, and he, the emperor, decides to make it possible for all religions to be legal in the Roman Empire. And this is big news for the Christians because it means that Christianity can now be an above-the-board legal religion. No more martyrdoms. They'll be able to just be a religion like everybody else. And that allows them to start building the first churches. Before this, they'd been hiding out in houses, but now they can build churches. So here's one of the first ones. It's a basilica called San, San Sabina. All basilicas look the same. They have these rows of columns holding up the walls. And at the far end, that's where the priests would conduct the services from. And they conducted it from behind these sort of, this kind of stone fence. Um, this is where, the, on the other side of that stone fence, they would hold up the host and the wine and so forth and um, uh, conduct the service. And on those stone fences, these stone screens, we see these images. So here we see two crosses, and um, unfortunately it's all in the same color, so we've had to boost the contrast. But underneath the crosses, you see two trees, and if you could see the image even more closely, you'd see vines are growing up in, inside the cross itself. Like the cross is decorated with vines inside of itself. And on the right-hand side, you see those two um, round things? They represent the moon and the sun. So an allusion to how it got dark while Jesus was being crucified. But the whole thing is wrapped in vines. And this is very common. These screens are just full of crosses that have vines spinning out of them. And this imagery is everywhere in early Christian buildings. In addition to going to Rome, I also went to Naples. And in Naples, they have, uh, in the Duomo Cathedral, there's the oldest room in the Western world where baptisms were conducted. This is the earliest baptistry that has still survived. And here's what it looks like. Can we um, just take off the subtitles for a second? Yeah, thank you. Or move them to the top, I guess, would work too. Um, so at the bottom of the floor, there is a basin that people would stand in to get uh, baptized. And the, it, it, was, it was quite deep, so as they came out of the water, they would look up into a domed ceiling, and that domed ceiling is still there. And the images that they saw are what we're going to see right now. So next image, please. Thank you, yeah. Um, and the imagery is of various Bible scenes, and in the middle there you see Jesus standing on the world with Peter and Paul on either side. And the problem is this thing's, you know, built in the 300s, so a lot of it's fallen down. <laughs> you know, things happen over time, right? So some of the images are missing, but um, there's Bible scenes all over, all over the ceiling. But what's really remarkable is how much nature are on these images. So, for instance, there's a scene of a deer drinking from fountains. There's a shepherd in the middle there, and then two deer on the sides, each drinking from fountains. And that's an allusion to Psalm 42. And there are also peacocks and birds among the plants. And this is, um, this is one of the side aspects of the, of the chapel. So there's peacocks and birds. And you can see it's just gorgeous. I mean, these peacocks and birds are uh, with uh, plants and fruit, and they're pecking from bowls of fruit. There's this sense of abundance, of natural abundance, which they decorate the entire dome with. When these early Christians wanted to speak about their faith, they couldn't do it without showing nature. That becomes abundantly clear as you go to all these places. Like, nature is always in the scene, one way or another. And this imagery is not just decorative. It's not there to be pretty. It's there to actually, it's there because it has to be, because it's meaningful. 
it visualizes a central idea about who Jesus was. In the opening of the Gospel of John, we are told that the one who will become Jesus of Nazareth helped God create the world and all of nature. And you know these words, they're famous ones. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. So John's gospel starts with the idea that everything that is alive, every single creature, every single bug, every single plant, everything on this planet is made through the one who we eventually will call Jesus. To these early Christians, Jesus was not just a moral Messiah, he was also nature's Messiah as well. And that's a different idea for us, but they really believed that Jesus was coming for the birds and the plants and the animals as well as for us, because he created them. Early Christians believed that when Jesus was baptized, they noticed that his very first act was to go into water because they believed that he started by sanctifying the water. Then he dealt with human beings. And his very first act after being baptized was he went into the desert for 40 days where the text tells us explicitly he was with wild animals. Nature first, people second. We needed help figuring out how to live, but that doesn't mean that he ignored the animals and the waters. He actually addressed them first and then came to us and spent a long time with us because we're God's problem child. The idea that Jesus may be nature's creator and Messiah is important for how nature itself is perceived. If nature was made by Jesus, then it can't be random or cruel in its design. The creation reflects the character of the creator. And of course, we know that Jesus teaches compassion and concern at every turn. And that influenced how early Christians saw nature. And I'd like you now to hear it from one of them. So what we're going to do now, I, I warned a few people today that this is a bit of an unusual sermon. What we're going to do now is we're going to hear the words of Clement of Rome. He was a bishop in Rome in the first century, near the end. And he wrote, a, in one of his uh, texts, he writes this beautiful prayer um, that deals with nature. And we're going to hear it. Laura Lane's going to read it, and the choir is going to help us out a bit too. Um, and just invite you to sit back and drink in these words. This is how they saw nature. The fruitful earth, according to God's will, brings forth food in abundance at the proper seasons for man and beast and all the living beings upon it, never hesitating nor changing any of the ordinances which God has fixed. The vast, unmeasurable sea, gathered together by the Lord's working into various basins, never passes beyond the bounds placed around it, but does as God commanded. For God said, thus far shall you come, and your waves shall be broken within you. The seasons of spring, summer, autumn, and winter peacefully give place to one another. The winds in their several quarters fulfill at the proper time their service without hindrance. The ever-flowing fountains, formed both for enjoyment and health, furnish without fail their breasts for the life of men. The very smallest of living beings meet together in peace and concord. All these the great creator and Lord of all has appointed to exist in peace 
and harmony. While God does good to all, but most abundantly to us who have fled for refuge to God's compassions through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory and majesty forever and ever. Amen. As you can hear, the early Christians did not imagine a hostile universe. They saw all of nature obeying Christ, who made it at the beginning of time. Stars obey by rotating in the sky. Whales and fish, bears and rabbits know what to do because God gave them, God made them in a way that keeps all species alive. Christians imagined a benevolent universe with Jesus as its Messiah. 2,000 years before modern ecological thinking, and they were already there. Everything is intertwined, everything works for the benefit of all. That's where they started. When I first announced that I was going to Rome, many of you came to me with suggestions about where I should go, and I appreciate that. And one of you, uh, Bonnie McLaughlin, uh, suggested that I just absolutely had to go see the Basilica of San Clemente. And it's named after the man whose words we just heard. And it was built in the, I guess, the 300s or the 400s. And I'm glad I went. Thank you, Bonnie, for suggesting it if you're watching online, because uh, it was gorgeous. And I'd like to show you what I saw. So if we can move the words to the top again, please. There we go. Um, so again, it's a basilica, so it's got those rows of columns on the side. And I went on a day that was brutally hot. The whole time I was there, it was brutally hot. Climate change is happening in Rome. It was always 35, 36, 37 degrees. And they don't have a lot of trees in Rome, so you know, that's hot. Um, anyway, so I was very glad to come into a nice, cool basilica. And I explored a bit, and it's an interesting place. I recommend going to it because it's got several layers below it that go back in time. But after exploring a bit, I sat down and I marveled at the mosaic, which is on the apse, which is the sort of dome at the back, at the front, rather. And this mosaic was made about a 1,000 years after the prayer that we just heard. You know, churches change. They do renovations. You know, like we do renovations. They did renovations, so things weren't the same you know, uh, over the years. So, uh, but a thousand years after he wrote those words, they did a renovation and they made this glorious mosaic. In the center of it, you can see Jesus is on the cross. And we'll show you a, a close-up shot in a second. He is surrounded, there we go, and he's surrounded by a golden heaven. But what's remarkable is that he's also just surrounded by nature. On the cross, there are doves, above him, beside him, below him. At the top, you see a hand. That's the hand of God, and in the hand of God is a vine. So again, thinking back to John's words that, you know, I am the vine, right? And you are the branches. So God is handing down life to the world in the form of a vine, and it's being represented as Jesus on the cross with Mary and John on either side of him. But at the foot of the cross, there's a tree of life. Four rivers flow out of it, and you can see two deer drinking out of those rivers. But you can also see tendrils, right, like vines coming out in both directions from this tree of life, which grows out of the cross, right? So grows out of Jesus. And if we can go to the next shot, the wide shot again, and those vines spin out and out and out and out and out, and they fill the entire dome. So it represents all of life coming out of Jesus on the cross. He is the source of life itself, all natural life. And it's hard to see. This thing's like way up there, uh, so it's hard to get good pictures of it. But the artist has also put in little scenes of daily life. Uh, happening all over the place. You know, monks reading books and people doing their laundry and stuff are all in, um, in among these vines. So it's a vision of how out of Jesus flows all of life itself. 
He is a Messiah for nature and humanity. But as we know, this, vi this vision of Jesus does not last. In the modern age, with the Enlightenment, a different idea was introduced. Nature becomes seen as dangerous. You know, human, Hume's famous line about nature, red and tooth and claw. You know, survival of the fittest from Darwin. We, get, we shift ideas and we get stuck on the premise that nature is actually out to get us. We come to believe that we are at war with nature, that it must be subdued. The answer to the question, who do you say that I am, changed. Jesus became the moral Messiah, no longer a nature's Messiah, just the moral Messiah. A division of labor set in. Science, you take nature. Religion will just take morality. The idea that nature was also precious to Christ and animated by Christ was set aside. An inconvenient religious idea. So Jesus became only a moral messiah. And we have paid the price for that shift. The whole world has paid a price for that shift. And in the face of climate change and the devastation of the natural world, recently theologians have been reconsidering their view of Jesus and nature. In the last few decades, theologians have been reconsidering our spiritual relationship with nature. What do we owe nature? What's its status in God's eyes? We keep thinking about where do we stand in God's eyes, but where does nature stand in God's eyes? The late Sally McFaig, a, a theologian, suggested that nature is actually God's body. Everything we do to nature, we're doing to God. Others have suggested that we need to reconsider our relationship with other living things. They point out that in the seven days of creation, they were made first. We were made last. The world could get along just fine without human beings. God pronounced each day of creation good, long before we were created. These theologians suggest that we would be much better off considering animals and plants and the oceans as fellow travelers in this life, fellow children of God, rather than just resources that are dead and ready for us to exploit. God cares about us both and may even have separate, different plans for the animals. In the book of Job, it's very clear that God thinks of whales and large land animals as different from human beings. God often addresses animals explicitly. At the end of the Noah's Ark story, when God promises never to do this again, never to flood the world again, he makes the promise not just to human beings, but also to animals. He makes a covenant with the creatures of the world. For all we know, the whales, the gorillas, who knows, the ants, they may actually have a part to play in the evolution of this world, separate from ours. We may not be the only children that God cares about and expects big things from. What we think is sacred determines what we consider is worth saving and what is expendable. When Jesus asked, who do you say I am, it still matters how we answer. All of creation is crying out for us humans to realize that we are not the only holy ones. They need us to wake up and realize that all forms of matter are loved by God. AI and technology cannot tell us what is sacred. Our machines will not figure this out for us. This is something we have to figure out on our own. And as Christians, this is a good time to remember that we started out thinking that nature was precious. And maybe we can get back there again. The question, who do you say I am, is more important than ever. Amen.